daughter was slapping on buttons. And like, <laughs> so it was like muted. I'm like, what did she do? I have no snare in my headphones. No. Um, I told you guys, you got the. It, this is this is about as clean energy as you can get. See a, as a, a fan of as clean living as I can yes. while living in this smoggy, smoggy delight, this was a wonderful, eye-opening experience. Well, they do it. I mean, it's it is the it is the clean energy. It is it does have the adaptogens. It has everything that you want from it, and it just it doesn't give you those jitters, right? You because yeah. Winston, when you you were telling me that was the whole thing. You everybody was always worried about with the energy drinks is the. Because I Jitters. was pounding them daily, yeah, I know, right? and now I don't need to. No, this is delicious, and it works exceptionally well. Somebody said that to me too. It's like, well, what? How's the taste? I go, it's good. It's like orange juice. It actually tastes, tastes like orange. All right, everybody, here we go. Ready? One, two, three. I just like how it gets my mind clear. It gets my mind clear. So I'm a big, um, I'm a big fan. It is indeed magic. I am a big fan of, of Magic Mind. So, guys, if you want to check out uh, Magic Mind, by the way, you you head on over to magicmind.com slash big thing, and you can get a really great discount, by the way. It's it's fantastic. And I'm glad. I'm glad that you guys have been with us already. Then I put that in there. I think uh, the fact that you can get 48% off yeah. right away if you it's use it. Yeah, it's great. Or you can just use the code one time, a big thing, and get 20% off. So, all right, we got things to talk about. Let's start yelling at each other. Yeah. All right, where, is, where the hell is this? F you. Hey. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to UAP Tuesdays. Thanks for joining us here on The Big Thing. Really appreciate you being here. As I always say, if you're brand new to the channel, you've never been here before, and you want to hear more about this topic, and you enjoy the point of view of not someone who tries to pretend that they're an expert in this field, and it is simply just asking questions. That's what we do here. If that is you, and you want to hear that perspective, then please subscribe to the channel. We're trying to get to 200,000 subscribers faster than we got to 100, but we need you guys to be part of it. It's free, costs you nothing. Just hit that button, because we have a really great episode here today. It's just me and Danny Sheehan, that's it. And he is one of the top advocates for disclosure. He runs a new paradigm. Dude, I'm going to go do the whole big in intro in just a little bit. I ask him a bunch of different questions. We talk for a very long time, and I think you're going to enjoy it. And I think that I wanted to come from it as a point of view of like, you know, I don't want to just say, oh, yeah, that sounds great. That's probably going to happen. Okay, because that's not how I'm feeling right now. I'm, I'm a little uh, uh, pessimistic is the word. And I ask him as much about certain things, about whether it's, the hearings, whether about is what, what exactly is catastrophic disclosure, um, that and much more. I mean, it's, it's it's a long conversation, and you're gonna you're gonna get a lot out of it. So make sure you comment, hit that like button. We're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, we're on the Down to Earth with Christian Harloff podcast feed. That's how you find us on audio. That's what helps the show as well. And if you want to see Monday through Friday news on UAP, shorter eh, three to five minutes or so. Go to the Down to Earth with Christian Harloff the channel. It is linked in the description. You can find it here. All right. Without any further ado, this is my interview with Danny Sheehan. Here it is. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, I'm very excited because my next guest, as you know, is one of the most important figures in the disclosure movement, and he's a prominent lawyer. He's worked on some of the biggest uh, and most important cases in American history, whether it's the Watergate, Pentagon Papers, Silkwood, the Greensboro Massacre. His list goes on and on and on. He is the current president of the New Paradigm Institute. Um, you've seen him everywhere. And he is representing, he represents Lou Elizondo. He is Mr. Danny Sheen. Hello, Danny. How are you? Terrific. Great. Good to see you. It's nice to have you on the show. Um, I don't know, and I wouldn't hold it against you if you know nothing about me or my show. <laughs> so, so the reason I say that is because I have, uh, I feel that I am the type of person that the New Paradigm um, Institute is all about, and that's really opening the eyes to people who don't know about this issue. Sure. 
Um, I have recently, I think like the last seven or eight months have really been diving down this. My, before before the last seven, eight months, my channel was pop culture movies. It still is, but for the most part, on Tuesdays, I've dove into this subject because I watched this program on um, – uh, it was on National Geographic, and it was the five part about discovering UFOs, discovering the unknown. And I saw your, I saw a bunch of different people the, about the New York Times article, and I've gone down the rabbit hole. As I learn this, the names, I have seen a lot of what you have done, sir. And I wanted to talk to you first. The first thing I wanted to bring up was Lou Elizondo and how important, obviously, he is to all of this. And there's this news about his book, and the last time on a recent podcast, you had said that at that time that we were going to get his book in roughly like six weeks, and there's been recent disinformation on that. Do you have any updates about the book itself? Uh, no, just I'm, I'm actually sending a – I've just got a text from Lou, just a second. <laughs> no, the, 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 the thing is that the, the, book, the book is in front of uh, the Defense Department uh, pre-publication – uh, review and security group, uh, and that they've been dragging their heels. There's only a, a few spots where they're kind of kibitzing with him uh, about what what they're they're saying is that what he has said in the book in a couple places does not, in fact, directly reveal any uh, uh, information that is national security information, but. They're concerned that it might lead people in the direction of looking at some of some of it, and uh, and so they're going back and forth a little bit. Uh, so it's, it's held it up. So I don't know how long ago it was that I was asked about that, but uh, we're still we're still he's still uh, tre walking back and forth like an expectant father, you know, waiting <laughs> right. waiting for word from them uh, and to to release that. So he he's got it all written. It's all edited. And they're just doing that review. Uh, and there have only been a few places where there was any controversy at all. But uh, that uh, I, I just sent a note to him to find out when he's expecting it to be released. Uh, but we'll, we'll find out. Yeah, because, I mean, obviously this is a highly anticipated book and everything that he has done. And he was, the, he was him and, and Mellon for what they've done for the New York Times, that article. That's how I first... I remember I was doing a show for Collider at the time, and that when that story broke, it was like, wait a minute, this isn't just science fiction. What the hell's going on in the sky out there? And that's like the big question of what is going on. And obviously there's some stories. I saw you on Ross Coulthard and the things that you had talked about, and those things kind of blew my mind. But there's this two sides of this thing, how this is working as far as, uh, as an outsider kind of looking in. Um, and there are people like yourself, for full disclosure, that are – very much believers know what they know. And then there's the other side of it. There's the, whether you call them the debunkers, that there's no way this is happening, the, those who want to just keep it quiet. Um, is there any way that you think that with the disclosure uh, agenda that you definitely have, is there a way to get those people that say, no, this this is all bullshit. This is all not, none of this is true. This he, this guy's trying to sell books. This guy's trying to do this. This is bullshit. Is there any way to get everybody on the same page? And do you eventually think that that will happen with disclosure? Sure. No, I do. Now, we, we, we've been down this road before. You know, the, when, when, you, when you finally, you know, you come up against the national security state infrastructure and you start telling the public about things that are going on. Uh, and, of course, the national security state people lie. Uh, because they think that they're authorized to do that. Uh, they believe that they've been authorized to lie and deceive our, quote, adversaries, mm -hmm. you know, outside of the country. And that's kind of their job. And the problem is that that kind of conduct kind of bleeds back into the country. Uh, and they think that it's OK to deceive the American public, uh, arguing that if you tell the American public, then you're telling your adversaries. Uh, and then they let it bleed back into the Congress. If you tell Congress, they're likely to tell somebody in the public. And then it's going to get out and our adversaries are going to get it. Uh, and so they're always trying to push back against it. That, that's, that's not it's a problem. But the real problem is that a lot of the people in the country uh, have been trained to, to wait until somebody in a position of authority tells them it's OK to believe something. Right. You know, and, and they, don't, they don't do 
I mean, it's understandable. People are busy. They've got other things. They've got families to raise. They've got jobs that they have to go to. You know, they need to watch the, the football game or baseball. Game right, the weekend, right. Or they've got to go to the store and get stuff for the kids. You know, and so they don't they don't do their own research on things. So they've dropped into a, a mode of waiting for people in positions of authority to tell them something. And what's happened is the national security state, you know, since at least 1947. Whoops. Uh-oh. What happened? Something just happened here. What happened? Can you, can you hear me still? I can see you. I can see you. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see if I can get my picture back here. You're, you're still, you're, your picture is still on for me. There's no problem on my end. Oh, okay, good. All right. So you're, uh, you're, you're okay. We're, we're good then. You're okay. So, so the, the bottom line is, is that the the national security state people have for decades been lying about this, and the problem is they presently still hold the upper hand uh, in convincing the people that they're the position, they're the people in positions of authority that they ought to listen to. Now, as we all know, the levels of trust uh, in the government have been steadily declining. Yeah. You know, almost every one of the institutions of the of the national security state are losing ground in credibility. And and so but, but what we have discovered is that in a lot of the cases that we've done down through the years, what we try to do is recruit one or more elements of the power structure to be on our side. Uh, and once you can start to do that, you can you can proffer the information uh, that we're trying to get out to people through one of those authoritative sources, uh, and then people start to listen. That's what's happened here with the New York Times. You know, in, in December of, night of 2017, Lou and Chris got the, the board of editors of the New York Times to agree to publish right on the front page, uh, you know, the information about these videos, and they published the videos over their internet, uh, New York Times, and people began to see that the a, a very commonly understood uh, authority uh, source in the culture, the New York Times, was telling them that it was okay to believe this. Mm -hmm. And so you got a shift in in the kind of attention that people had. Then, when we got David Grush to testify, and we got the the House Oversight Committee to agree to call him in a public hearing and have him assert under oath that uh, he was knowledgeable from his direct interviews of, of dozens and dozens of people with firsthand information that we have a, a long-standing UFO crash recovery program right. underway uh, and that we've actually recovered, you know, uh, extraterrestrial non-human origin spacecraft. Uh, and we've recovered bodies, non-human bodies with the craft. Now, when that kind of authoritative statement got made mm -hmm. by a you know a full colonel that was at the highest levels of the national reconnaissance office uh, uh and was a member of the uap or ufo task force uh pe even more people started paying attention right. to what is this going on now so what we have is we have this uh, choreography underway right now of enlisting more and more powerful and influential sources of authority in communicating this to people so that the people in the national security state, deep in the, in, in the infrastructure, who keep on just flatly asserting this isn't true, the UFOs aren't real, there's nothing here to see, this is just swamp gas or flocks of birds that are being misidentified, <clears throat> you know, that, that they're, they're becoming more and more isolated uh, and uh, more and more a tiny minority voice, even among position, people in positions of authority. So... <clears throat> what we're working on right now is trying to get the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, to hold public hearings and to bring on uh, one or more of the 40 uh, first-hand eyeball witnesses that they have interviewed uh, and whom they've been able to corroborate yeah. their stories uh, to bring them forward uh, and to present even more information. All of this is designed to put pressure on the the few people in the House of Representatives who sit in kind of authoritative positions, for example, Michael Turner, mm -hmm. who is uh, the chair of the, the the House Intelligence Committee, who is blocking this, and this guy Michael Johnson, who's the new kind of uh, hanging by his fingernails Speaker of the House, 
uh, you know, who's who's also refused to bring the full 64 page bill that we've gotten passed by the Senate, refused to bring it to the floor uh, of the of the House of Representatives. Uh, but the, but the bottom line is, as soon as the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, holds their uh, hearing and starts bringing forth more eyeball witnesses, the pressure is going to continue to build on people, those handful of people in the House who are blocking uh, the House voting for this. And we're going to get, I believe, the passage of what is effectively the 64-page bill that was originally right. passed by the Senate. Uh, and once we get that, we're going to have a, therefore, an authoritative, that's the key to this thing, an authoritative U.S. congressional uh, body, which is the, the, uh, the UFO uh, Records Review Board, uh, in operation, crafting a, a disclosure plan, right. an actual campaign. Uh, to roll out the information that is in the possession of our government about UFOs and the extraterrestrial civilization or, you know, non-human intelligence behind the UFO phenomena. So that's that's what's going on right now. So a, a larger and larger number of people out in the general population who have been trained uh, by their public school education, for the most part, uh, and even through some of their uh, college education, uh, to just listen to people in positions of authority, more and more people are turning their attention to this going, wait a second, there are people in positions of authority uh, who are saying this is true, maybe I better pay more attention to it. Uh, and that's what the job of the New Paradigm Institute is. We're, we're organizing people in all 435 congressional districts, uh, Republicans and Democrats alike, since this is a broadly bipartisan issue, you know, even some of the most conservative people in the Republican Party are supporting this. Virtually all of the moderates in the Republican Party support this. And virtually all the progressives and regular moderates and liberals in the Democratic Party support this. It's just a tiny handful of people uh, in positions of power, who most, uh, virtually all of whom come from districts that are under the complete domination of the private aerospace right. corporations. Uh, that are blocking this. So the, the, this process is underway right now. And so what you're going to have is a, a kind of a falling away of the, uh, the blocks uh, over people's eyes about this phenomenon. And, it's going to st and what we have to do is to make sure that the information that's flowing to people through the New Paradigm Institute uh, is objective, fair, has been carefully vetted, and step by step people can be brought into realizing what the truth is of all of this and separate it from the kind of ugly fictions that have been uh, put into major Hollywood movies, you know, over the past 50 years, you know, that they're coming here to eat us, you know, Independence Day and, you know, uh, Dark Skies and, and, and all these uh, terrible, uh, they, they've just got very bad galactic politics, you know, they're like old racist movies, like, you know, <laughs> right. the birth of a nation, you know, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that so we're we're that, that's the new paradigm institute is trying to bring this new information out to everybody in a in a carefully vetted and choreographed way, so people can begin to have the the scales fall from their eyes and realize that this is a reality, and that we have to start developing a comprehensive worldview that takes this into account and integrates it with all the rest of our information. Um. Look, there's so much in there of what you just said, and I had about 45,000 questions to follow up with a lot of that because there's so much stuff in there, and I want to start with the with the rounds and Schumer bill, of what you said, the how it was in one form and how it, how important it was for that particular form to go through, and you had someone like a Mike Turner, and, 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 and it was essentially kind of gutted, if you will, and... I had both Tim Gallaudet on the show recently, and I and I talked to him about the Soul Foundation videos. And inside of every single one of those videos, it was it was recorded in November. It was released after the bill got gutted, but it was recorded beforehand. And every one of those videos was so dependent on that bill getting passed in the form that it was in. Now, when I had Steve Bassett on the show, he said exactly the same thing that you just said. You guys are very confident in the fact that this will get passed eventually. What's going to change? What's going to change? 
change that Mike Turner's not going to be able to do this again? What's going to change that, that, you know, someone else is not going to, uh, you know, say, no, wait a minute, because as uh, I always quote George Knapp and what he says about they're better at their job than we are at ours. This is for 80 years. They've been able to do this and throw ways into making sure that they can do what they do. What's going to change here? And why is this bill going to get passed? Well, that uh, that uh, number one, it's extremely important to understand that the that the uh, the the wailing and the gnashing of teeth that went on after the uh, after uh, Johnson, Michael Johnson, the Speaker of the House, refused to put the 64 page bill on the floor. He knew perfectly well that if it was put on the floor for a vote that we would win. Uh, and so what he did is he agreed to. To if, if they he would take out 40 pages of the bill and put you know 24 pages in and and let it pass and what's important to understand is that even in that 24 pages it specifically commands the 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 six United States military services all 18 of the United States intelligence agencies all 32 of the United States Defense Department agencies and all of the private aerospace corporations that have any information whatsoever about the UFO issue or the uh, the non-human intelligence that's assumed to be behind it, any and all that information has to be gathered together and put into digital form with an index and and a a computer recovered, a recoverable uh, capacity and provided to the National Archives as soon as possible following 300 days from the passage of the bill on Mm -hmm. December 22nd. So on October 18th of this year, we're going to to arrive at that particular date, and they are going to be ordered at that point to turn over the information because they've been mandated to gather it together. And, uh, And that's going to be like a whole new day because if they refuse to do it, uh, and they refuse to abide by the rule of the Congress, it's going to be immediately necessary to to put teeth back in, back into the statute to be able to force them to do it. <clears throat> what we're trying to do is get that done beforehand so that we won't come to the point of October 18th and they just stall. Right. So that, that's actually the situation that we're in. It's not that, it's not that uh, everything has been gutted from the bill even though I fully understand how upset people were about the fact that a lot of the enforcement mechanisms were taken out. Yeah, it's, that's to me, that's to me where I mean because you and and I get confused though too as someone again who's watching from the outside because I see like there's there, now there's let there's letters being written to Speaker Johnson about about you know approving the 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 uf the uap commute uh committee there's and and it seemed and when they asked they go yeah i think that he is going to support it but then i hear people like yourself who seem like he's one of the ones that's trying to block it so i get confused like who's on what side who's trying to do yeah. it, no, he's it, not he's not going to do it voluntarily you know that that what we have to do the new paradigm institute is going to be organizing people inside the 10th congressional district in ohio which is the home district in ohio uh, not not only for Michael Johnson, uh, or excuse me, Michael Turner, but also for the uh, the Wright Patterson Air Force Base, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and so that the fact of the matter is, there's a, a huge percentage of the people inside his district who want him to do this. So that we have to we have to choreograph the the <clears throat> the effort to make it clear to him that a majority of his own constituents want him to do this. But the problem is, under the way our government is presently run, that doesn't control uh, what an elected representative does. What, what controls him is who pays for his campaign. Right. <clears throat> and, and, you know, you get also like over in, uh, over in the House Armed Services Committee, uh, you've got Michael Rogers, uh, who is from the 2nd second, second Congressional District in Alabama, uh, and that's where the Redstone Rocket Range is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the, the, the bottom line is, is that, that his major financial supporter is Lockheed Martin, uh, which is trying to back engineer right. the UFO technology. So, so the, the bottom line is uh, that it's not likely that they're going to change <clears throat> because their funders are not going to change. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, so the bottom line is, what's what's going to change is that 
if the Senate Intelligence Committee resolves that it is going to start bringing additional witnesses out and putting them into public hearings. Yeah. And they're going to start revealing more and more of the information. <clears throat> the other side is going to start realizing that what they're afraid of, which is, quote, catastrophic uh, disclosure. Yes. That, is going to start happening. Okay, so that I'm glad you brought that up because that's that's one of the things that I wanted to ask you about when it comes to the, there's there's many definitions as they mentioned in the Cell Foundation they mentioned uh, many times over what catastrophic disclosure could be whether that's leaks whether that's other countries coming forward to doing it um, and then the, the the yesterday on Ross Colhart's show. He talked about there was a question that came in and it was asked about the frustration, as you earlier mentioned, where people were like, OK, there's everybody said whether it was Lou, whether it was James Fox, whether it was a lot of people said, wait until the beginning, wait until January 2024. You're going to see some stuff that you've never seen before. And then we're here we are in March, April. And I know it's, it takes time, but there's still not these big things yet. And as you said, behind the scenes, there's a process that's going on. Right. But like whatever this this catastrophic disclosure will be, let's start with that. Because let's say that the same thing happens again with this with this bill, and and they are and there's a way for them to do the same thing that they did, and the frustration is real. What do you believe catastrophic disclosure will look like? Will it be leaks from other uh, from from other people, other? F and what is that leaks? Is it footage? Like what what is it? What do you think catastrophic disclosure is? Well, what what what, it, what let, let, let's step back a little bit from the question is. <clears throat> What is the the increased threat of potential catastrophic disclosure look like? Yeah, uh, and we know what that looks like, and that is having the Senate Intelligence Committee start bringing forward some of these forty witnesses. But don't they get in trouble if they do, if they do that without? Well, I mean, with... Congress of the United States has the right to grant uh, immunity. Okay. To that. Okay. Uh, 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 I mean, co Congress has the authority to grant immunity to witnesses that they want to get information from. They did it all during the Iran Contra thing. You know, they granted immunity to people like Oliver North, mm -hmm. et cetera. You know that they can do that. Sure. And so that when they're when they're engaged in a quest to find information, which is necessary for their exercise of constitutional oversight, uh, they have the authority to grant immunity to people. Uh, and uh, and so that's the kind of thing that. And when, when they start rolling forward and they're not only going to be coming forward saying things like, here, let me give you the confirmation for the UFO crash retrieval program. Here's the, the date of a different of a particular retrieval. Here are two witnesses who are there. Here are people who loaded the vehicle onto an 18 wheeler. And here's where they took it to. <clears throat> and, you know, when you start getting testimony like that. Uh, which information is in fact available, mm -hmm. uh, then the other side is going to say, holy mackerel, this is catastrophic. You know, they're starting to actually force out information that we demand to keep secret because uh, they aren't going to be able to keep it secret <clears throat> as long as the Senate Intelligence Committee is willing to put it out publicly. OK, so that now that that is not catastrophic in and of itself, even though they might think it is. Uh, but that's a threat. Of potential is catastrophic. Uh, so the next question is, what would catastrophic be? Now, the the uh, I've gotten uh, clear indications from having conversations with people on the other side of this, uh, what they think is catastrophic about it. One of the most important things is they're afraid of the authority. Well, first of all, they're afraid of people being criminally prosecuted right. uh, for the things that they have done to keep it secret lying to Congress, committing perjury to Congress, you know, uh, threatening people, potentially assaulting people, yeah. uh, and potentially killing people. <clears throat> so I would imagine I would imagine lawsuits as well, too. A lot of lawsuits, a lot of lawsuits in the in the business area of, you know, uh, violating antitrust laws, right. or giving giving the stuff secretly to one corporation and giving them an advantage over others without any bidding on the you know, there's lots of different legal violations here. Uh, and they're they're concerned about those. But secondly, <clears throat> there's a very real fear of the undermining of the credibility uh, of the people in the national security state, uh, that the American people will lose faith in them uh, if they believe that they've been consciously lying to the American people all the time. Uh, and it's, you know, that they've already lost confidence in the Supreme Court. 
Mm -hmm. losing, they've, they previously lost confidence in the two political parties being able to solve anything. So you get all of these third party people now talking about running and the, 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 the national security state people uh, have, a, have a lot at stake here. Uh, and, but, but very importantly, what they're really afraid of, the national security state people believe that they're functioning on behalf of the ruling elite. And that's that's who basically they believe they're representing. Right. Uh, that you you look at the for example you look at the 1992 United States Defense Department policy planning guidance document. Uh, it's a big top secret uh, Defense Department uh, document that was prepared under Dick Cheney, uh, in the Paul Wolfowitz, his deputy, in in Doug Fife, in the, in Scooter Libby, and that crowd, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they flat out stated that they believed that their real mission was to secure and to maintain the continued privileged access to the strategic raw materials on the planet for, for our country. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> now, now that's a craven uh, objective, uh, but they fully realize that that is their objective. Uh, and so that if, in fact, it, it is made clear to the American public that the, the United States national security people are not, in fact, protecting democracy, they're not, in fact, you know, protecting, you know, American, innocent American citizens abroad, et cetera, uh, you know, that they're, in fact, engaged in an aggressive war yeah. uh, to attempt to secure access to the strategic raw materials for our major corporations, basically, uh, that, the, that, that threatens the entire legitimacy of the present ruling uh, governing elite. Sure. Uh, and that's what they're afraid of. Yeah. I mean, I, I think all that makes sense when it when it comes to why they wouldn't want it and what what they're fighting against. I think it's just because as, as that you again, you mentioned earlier, the frustration side of it and the idea that I am now um, on. I, I just am in this place where I think, that, well, they're going to push. They're going to block it. They're going to do something. We're not going to get these hearings. We're not going to get these things. And I start to get into like a pessimistic mode, right? Because you mentioned these particular whistleblowers that are coming through or new new witnesses. And I asked I asked Tim Gallaudet when he was on the show, and I heard you say the same thing when Ross Colhart asked you. He asked you if you would testify. You said yes. I asked Tim Gallaudet if he would testify. He said yes. Um, I think that, you know, when you hear uh, James Lukaski talking about the things that he had seen and the breaching of the hole and the stuff that he talked to about with Jeremy Corbell, that they would want to get him. I would think that Carl Nell would be somebody that they would want to get. Do you have any idea? Do you have any clue of who you think would be the, the people that should come forward, would come forward? And do you stick with the fact that you would absolutely go in there and testify yourself? Oh, yeah, but, <clears throat> but we're. The, the ones you've mentioned are not the, are not the key people. Uh, the key people are the ones who've laid their hands directly on the crap. Yeah. You know, uh, they are the ones who may have engaged in a program to actually try to bring them down, uh, okay. you know, to recover their technology. Uh, it's the kind of people that are directly involved in the back engineering program, you know, that can give the give the Congress and the public the details of what it is they've been doing. You know, not secondhand information, hearsay information. I was able to provide to Sean Kirkpatrick and Arrow uh, the fact that I had seen the photographs, right. you know, uh, in an official capacity of a, of a crash recovery. There wasn't any doubt about what it was. So clearly they had a crash recovery program, you know, functioning. So I could tell him that. So it clearly is untrue for them to come out publicly and say they have been provided no credible evidence that there's a crash recovery program. You yeah. know, I mean, that just was false. You know, but the, but the bottom line is when you bring a person forward who says, you know, not not only, you know, have I seen photographs of crash recovery programs, I participated in them. Do you think you that's know? likely? Is that likely that they're going to get people like that? Or do you think well, they've that, already got people like that? You th OK. And and so they've already got people like that. So you know, they, and they're just lined up and they're sitting there waiting to go. So and, that and, and OK, when you look at it when you when you've got not only the people willing to come forward to assert it. Uh, but to be able to corroborate it with the other witnesses, uh, and then the the staff of the United States Senate is willing to solicit that information from them and put them under oath and get it in a codified form so they're in possession of it. And then the leadership of the Senate Intelligence Committee is prepared to start having conversations about bringing them forward publicly, right? Uh, and to 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 break the logjam when you ask, you know, what is it that's going to cause you know, uh, Michael Turner 
to change his mind. It's not it's not organizing even the majority of people in his 10th congressional district in Ohio that uh, that they want him to do it. You know, it's when he's going to see that they can't stop the information from coming out. Well, clearly in not. Yeah. Structure, in structure than another authoritative structure like the United States Senate Intelligence Committee has decided to go public with it. That's that's where you get the screws put on them. All right. I love getting you guys good deals and I got it. Roan, there's so much pain in trying to find what to wear. Whether it's uncomfortable, it's tight, it's never your size, there's difficulty putting pieces together when all the fabrics are different textures. I know it happens to me all the time. You want to look good without having to think about it. Well, that's where Roan comes in. They stepped up to the challenge, everybody. They got the commuter collection. It's comfortable, it's breathable, and it's versatile set of products known to man. They have products for every occasion, whether it's the most comfortable pants, dress shirts, quarter zips, polos, blazers. They look great as individual pieces, and they work seamlessly together. Roan's signature four-way stretch fabric, it's breathable, it's flexible, and it works everywhere from your commute to work to the 19th hole. It's time for unparalleled confidence without all the hassle. Roan's commuter collection features wrinkle-release technology, and it is 100% machine washable, looking good is that easy i'm telling you i love this they sent me some of this stuff guys and i first of all they have the kind of just relaxing casual stuff but i needed a good pair of pants to go with my suit and my goodness i got some for me i got some for riley we're looking slick it is so great the commuter collection is easy to care for also by the way and it stays fresh and it's odor free just head over to roan.com slash big thing use that promo code big thing save 20 percent off your entire order that's 20 percent off your entire order when you head to r-h-o-n-e.com slash big thing use that code big thing it's time to find your corner office comfort vessi so john i got these i got these new shoes um and they have like it's like rain wear it's really really it's incredible I love, they sent it to me a while ago, but I'm so excited to tell them about them. Like the, for us, we, I want to tell you that Vessi has like this innovative, it's like footwear and it's designed for spring weather. Um, it's great. So Stormburst Vessis are the ones that I really want to kind of emphasize. And they're your go-to for every setting, city streets, to outdoor adventures, enhancing your style and activity with ease. So you can, whether it's snowy trails, wet streets, morning dew walk. So whether you're facing unexpected snow or slippery paths, it's so crucial in general to have these. Like I've, I'm planning a move. I've talked about this, but it's been raining a lot in LA and I've been wearing my vesties everywhere. And I have, and you guys seen it. I've been wearing the one, the, the, the one hoodie that I had that they sent me. I love it. It's one of my favorite things. I love these hoodies. I've worn it on in, in so many different um, videos. They have all weather, all occasion footwear from beach days to snowy communities. They have so many different things. You should elevate your spring wardrobe when you travel with Vessi's Stormburst shoes. You can discover more at Vessi.com slash big thing. Get your pair today and get an automatic 15% off your first purchase at checkout and be ready to step out into style. It is great stuff. I love Vessi. Really, really enjoy Vessi. I mean, it, it, yes, if they can get... The, that that type of witness to come forward, especially in another public hearing, that's right. th then that's going because this is one of the things I talk about on my show all of the time. Now, you have a major outlet like News Nation who covers this, right? And, and in conjunction, The Hill. But the whether it's the CNN, Fox, MSNBC, the, the major kind of news networks on the television networks, they're still not covering this thing in a way the very similar to what you were just mentioning before with the average person who's going to the football game or doing these things they sit down to watch the news and if it's not and normally what the stories will be especially this year it'll be biden trump cat in a tree and then they they won't even cover this thing but if they have somebody you would assume it would be irresponsible if you have somebody who said i touched this craft i did this in front of a hearing this would be the thing that the major networks covered am i wrong here well it's a well we'll we'll see but 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 the fact of the matter is if you start if you start uh, rolling forward not only one witness but another witness and another witness after that right. uh, that are just increasing the momentum on what the information is that's being released that is what the threat of, of potentially ca catastrophic, from their point of view, disclosure looks like. Uh, and that, that's playing hardball. 
And so the, the, the issue is now, you know, is the Senate Intelligence Committee ready to play hardball? Uh, with these tiny handful of guys that are in the pocket of the aerospace. Do you think they are? Yes. Okay. I do think they are. Okay. Well, the question question is whether they're going to throw high, fast ones at them. Right. You know, to brush them back, you know, uh, you know, in in the, that's, that's what's going on right now. They're trying to brush them back uh, and say, okay, we'll step back and we'll let you get the, the 64 page bill put in and have a full, you know, a campaign organized, a, a clear, coherent, uh, structured, responsible campaign to publicly disclose this information. That's what the objective is. You know, it's not just to dump all of this on the whole world all at one time, uh, you know, so that people can't even comprehend what they're being told. You know, this needs to be put out in a, in a clear, comprehensive way. Uh, and that's what we're proposing. That's what the Senate now wants to do. The Senate has made it clear in their 64 page bill. And when you have, this is just to help make you a little bit more optimistic. When you have the United States Senate, uh, all 17 members of the intelligence community, uh, the committee, all eight Republicans and all eight, nine Democrats, all voting unanimously without any objection to the 64 page bill and putting it into law, that uh, you've got a powerful coalition of, of people in positions of authority who have decided they're going to do this. Right. Uh, and when you get just a, a tiny handful of individuals who are so clearly, manifestly in the pocket of the private aerospace corporations, you know, blocking them, using, misusing the authority of their positions as chairs of these couple of key committees to block them, you know, then it's time to play hardball. And it's time to throw hard, high, fast ones at them, brush them back from the plate. Uh, and if they're going to be still willing to, to stay in there, then, then you, then you give them the, you know, give them the start nipping at the corners, you know, and, yeah. and, and strike them out. Okay, That's so, so let's. I'll play optimist for a second then, and let's say that the that the bill is cleared as it was presented last yeah. year, and it is. So what what's to stop the uh, these powers that be that have been doing this for years upon years to say, okay, well now they, they have the authority now to come get us. Uh, we know when they're we're, what they're going to try to do. Let's move everything. Well, we have we have location. We know what the location is. Well, let's move it. How do we know that they just won't? Because it's it's not going to be raids. They're going to be like, oh, we're, you think it'll be raids? I can, tell you, I can tell you, they're not that good at it. You know, once once you get subpoena power, uh, and once you start having professional investigators in the field. Uh, and you have a, a place to bring the information to. Uh, I've done this over and over again. You know, you, you can be sure that in the Iran-Contra case, they didn't want uh, to have revealed where they were smuggling the weapons into the Contras. Yeah. Uh, but we tracked them down to the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport. We tracked them down to the Ilopango uh, U.S. Joint Air Force Base in El Salvador. You know, we got the tail numbers on the airplanes. We got the shipping invoices. Uh, we got the serial numbers on the weapons. I mean, we just pounded the crap out of these people. Once you get into a position of having subpoena power okay. uh, and you and you start fielding professional investigators, they, they're not going to be able to stand up to that. So you think and, that's you know, kind of that would kind of be the beginning of the end of this whole kind of beginning of the, right. the project Blue Book type thing? That's right. OK. And then so but if there is this kind of slow drip disclosure attempt from the government, you know, they they were the ones that have kind of kept the secret in the first place, right? So, do you trust the efforts? Sure. Do you trust the efforts one hundred percent? Do I trust the efforts? Yeah, the efforts on the fact that the government is, you know, they say that they want to do these particular things. I know what you guys are are doing, obviously that that you you trust what you guys are doing, but that you know, when is there any? Do you ever? The politicians are politicians. You ever see this? And is there any alternative motives? Do you feel that this is actually that these efforts are all 100 percent honest, that they're going to do what they say that they're going to do? And because, like I said, they've kept this secret no. in the first place for years. They're, they're never they're never 100 percent honest. I mean, you know that. Right. Uh, you know, but but the bottom line is, is that this is how things actually do get done in an imperfect world. You know, this is how they get done, <clears throat> you know. And so that I recognize this. I've been at this for 50 years, mm -hmm. and as you pointed out at the top of the program. You know, we've we've done this thing tracking down. You know, we shut down the single center for the nuclear reprocessing of spent nuclear fuels in the country, and caught them smuggling, uh, you know, bomb grade plutonium to Israel and in Iran. We we made it public and mm -hmm. we got them. We shut down the entire facility. We cut off that supply. 
we're the ones that caught them smuggling the weapons to the Contras and smuggling the cocaine back into the United States. You know, we're the ones that got that done. We're the ones that got the, the all 47 volumes of the Pentagon Papers published, actually. <clears throat> you know, and the national security state not only didn't want any of those things to happen, right. they were doing everything they could do to stop it. And they were unable to stop it. Uh, now, that's the benefit of having a democracy, even as un- imperfect as it is right now. And I, I have become, if I do say so myself, quite expert in knowing what the capabilities are of our democratic institutions mm-hmm. and what, what they're not. You know, and and just because they're not perfect doesn't mean that you can't make them work. Right. Uh, if, if it takes longer than it's supposed to, uh, you get less than you should. Uh, but it it becomes effective sources of change. Uh, and then this particular thing is the is deepest secret that our entire national security state harbors, uh, and that they're going to fight hard. But once we get our hands on the subpoena power, and once we have the right to take depositions. Once we have the right of eminent domain to be able to exercise control over seeking out and finding those those craft and removing them, I mean, we know now where some of the craft are, you know, uh, and and so that you know that we can get that done, uh, and I I don't I don't have any doubt that we can do that. But what we need to do is build the team of people who are in positions of authority who are backing us, because it always comes to the end where they all say. We've always been on your side. Right. We've always been wanting to get this done. You know, uh, and it's like the Catholic Church. Every time they change their position, they say, as we've always taught, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the, we're, we're going to have everybody on board uh, pretty much by the time we get this done. And I think we're going to get it done during the next administration. Whoever oh. the next administration is, we're going to get this thing done. Which would make more sense than it happening this year, right? Because it does oh, seem, yeah. yeah, because it does I'm seem not that. Hearings, I'm not saying the public hearings won't happen this year. I think they will. You do? Okay. Oh, yeah, yes. Oh, yeah. Because, the, you know, because we, we've got to continue to put the pressure on uh, the, the tiny handful of opponents to this to, to try to get this rolling out. Because October 18th is coming. Right. Uh, and they are under the command of Congress to gather all this information together. So that they've got to have it uh, in that, uh, you know, if, if, if it gets to that point of October 18th and they all start whining, at, you know, the dog ate my uh, my homework or, you know, I can't find her. My mother's horse died or, you know, <laughs> right. it, 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 you, you, we're, we're going to have to land on them, you know, yeah. so we're going to have to land on them hard and fast. What's more important, in your opinion, that uh, obviously the public hearings over the, the field hearings, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I. Because the public hearings are vastly more important. That, that's They're what I would important. assume as well, too. And yeah. then I said, and, I, and I, 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 I know, I know, Tim. Tim wants to have field hearings, but you know, the field hearings are, are sort of little shows. Is that? But it, but doesn't it doesn't come with the legal imprimatur of the Congress? And, I, and yeah, that's that's what we need. Uh, I feel the same. And and before, and I have another question to follow that up. But before I do, because you just mentioned Tim Burchett, you know, he was on, he was, and I think Ross Colhar as well, and he. So what, what's your position on this? There's a lot of upper echelon politicians and uh, and other people that are scared of the phenomenon in general because it's potentially demonic in nature. Like, what what are your comments on that? Because when I started hearing that with de- demons and angels, I think that that can get the regular average person going, oh, wait a minute. They think it's angels and demons flying spaceships. Like, what, what's happening here? Well, you know, look, the, 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 there are certain elements within our, our American community uh, that you know that we're going to have to cope with. I mean, you know, the 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 most ardent fundamentalist uh, Christians uh, in in the country, you know, have thought that the entire issue of there possibly conceivably being any intelligence anywhere else in the entire universe is a completely diabolical idea. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, how would Jesus have been the only true Son of God? Right. You know, I mean, <clears throat> so that you know that that you that you know what with what with all due respect whatever limit amount that may be to those who hold those kind of opinions, you know, they, they can't be allowed to govern. Uh, you know, the, those are, those are bizarre, uh, and crazy ideas. Uh, and so you have to isolate those. Uh, and they, they may, that may serve well for Tim's constituency, you know, in the Hills of Tennessee somewhere, you know, but, but it, it's not, it's not a policy. Uh, and, and there aren't that many people who think that they're demonic. And they don't think that that's the nature of the conversation that's going on here, you know. Uh, and you know, having you know spent ten years at Jesuit headquarters, 
you know, in Washington, D.C., yeah. I know that there's a much, much more sophisticated theological conversation <coughs> going on than that. That's that's a, you know, a kindergarten, first grader kind of opinion. Uh, but there are there are uh, postgraduate school levels of understanding of the theology involved in all of this. Uh, and they will, in fact, come forward. Uh, so that that's that's not a, that's not a terribly significant problem. The real the real challenge is the uh, the national security state people thinking that their job is to protect the ruling elite, right. the governing elite, the the kind of people that go to Davos and the people that are in the the, uh, the World Economic Forum in uh, the, the people that, that own and run the, the oil corporations, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, it's, it, all make, it all makes sense, and yet it's all so infuriating because it's like if this is what it potentially could be and the fact that you could have answers about whether it's are we alone, what kind of technology could further and benefit us as, in, as individuals on this planet, and they've been held up because of greed, because of religion, because of whatever it might be. It's infuriating. You know, it, it, it really is. But let me ask you, like, what in your heart of hearts, what do you believe this is? Because we get we get the question or or the hint, because he's never, even though people say that he said it, he never really said point blank, David Grush, that they were in, interdimensional and they could tr travel interdimensional. Um, but it's certainly been hinted. Um, there's a, a Representative Luna has hinted at it. There's also things that, from very much so, when I talked to um, f retired uh, Grand Admiral G Gallaudet, he the, the USOs, the fact that they're in the water, potentially. What do you in your heart of hearts believe? Are these things coming from different planets? Are these things coming from interdimensionals? Are, what do you believe it is? But I, I believe, like, you know, having, having conducted, you know, professional investigations for, for 50 years now, that what, what we usually discover is that uh, two or more different phenomena are interacting uh, in that they, they cause confusion that, and people start to conflate the things, okay? That uh, that the I think clearly that the whatever the means of transport is, that the that most of these at least the five most clearly recognized uh, species of these uh, extra flat out extraterrestrial beings, mm -hmm. uh, the the method by means of which they transit from their star system to here presents itself as though it looks like it's extra dimensional. That they, for example, unveil, they unmask, they 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 kind of manifest as a uh, all of a sudden there they are, or they can disappear from our from our vibrational frequencies that we can we can see. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, the Central Intelligence Agency has developed an entire technology that is able to discern the UFOs even when they're fully masked. You know, so that doesn't mean they're coming from some other dimension. It means that they're that they're it, it, they're transiting in some kind of a vibrational frequency uh, that is not within the normal spectrum that we can see, and so that 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 for people who have a fairly limited uh, understanding of of biophysics, you know, can say, well, that must be extra dimensional, right. and then they drop into this many universes theory that you know there are multiple dimensions, and therefore there are multiple entire worlds and universes that exist at a different vibrational frequency. And you don't think that's possible? It's not that it's not possible. What I'm saying is that even following the, the, the maxims of Occam's razor, you know, given the fact that you, we now know uh, how many, that, that there are vastly more stars uh, in star systems, sure. uh, in, in galaxies in our universe than we ever thought. Was, now that we've mounted the space-borne telescopes. Right. I mean, it started out, you know, 50 years ago, uh, the scientists speculated there were like 100 billion stars in our in our galaxy. Then, you know, we, we put up the Hubble, went, oh, well, okay, uh, I guess there's 200 billion stars in our mm -hmm. galaxy. Then they put up the Planck, uh, uh, in the, oh, well, there's 300 billion. You know, now, now we've got the, the James Webb telescope up, and they're saying, wait a second, it looks like there's more like 500 billion uh, star systems just in our own galaxy. Right. <clears throat> Uh, and they found they found one galaxy that's apparently got a trillion stars in it, <laughs> right? Yeah. So what I'm saying is that you just take the most simple explanation of this uh, in the fact that our planet has clearly been able to gestate life here on our planet, 
uh, and that we follow the kind of biophysical process by means of which that's actually happened on our planet. And it is clear that it could happen in uh, numerous other planets. And we ourselves are knocking on the door right now of kind of opening the secrets of superluminal travel. Right. You know, that we're actually through the colliders that we have, the particle colliders, we're starting to discover uh, subcomponent elements of the atom that can travel uh, faster than the speed of light, the tachyon, tachyon now that they've got, or the tachyon it's called. Mm -hmm. you know, so we're knocking on the door ourselves of being able to figure this out. So you take a, you take a star system that is like, you know, 10 billion years old uh, and, and our, our whole our whole planet is only 4.5 billion years old. That you you give them another two or three billion years of being able to do technological development. It's not shocking that they could have discovered how to engage in superluminal travel. So that that you know that and you have all the evidence of, of dozens and dozens of very credible people who have had direct face to face contact with some of the occupants of these vehicles. And they've, for example, a Betty Hill was presented with a star chart right. uh, and they run it through a computer and they say, holy mackerel, look at that. That's that's uh, Zeta Reticuli, okay, where they say they're from. You know, then that's just a very simple, prosaic uh, bread and butter kind of explanation for a substantial portion of all of these UFO sightings and the beings that are in them. Uh, and the fact that the means of transport manifests itself or presents itself uh, as appearing as though they're extra dimensional, that's conflated with an entirely other thing. Uh, and the other thing is that weird thing that's going on at uh, Skinwalker Ranch and some other places. There are portals. That's, that's pretty clear. The native, native population has known this for a thousand years, that there's some kind of a phenomenon where there are portals that seem to open up on to some other place. Uh, and, and I believe at the present time that that is a, a different phenomenon. And there's an entire third phenomenon, which is this thing that they call spiritual. Uh, you know, and everybody's trying to conflate that now, saying, oh, all the miracles in the past must have been UFOs coming. You know, that uh, Jesus must be from the Pleiades, you know, or, or these prophets that have, uh, Ezekiel and all these people, right. uh, and, uh, and Elijah must have been from an extraterrestrial civilization. That's just sophomoric, non-analytical thinking. And you have to be careful about that, to conflate two or three different things. I've encountered that numerous times uh, in investigations, that two or three different things, like two or three different cars coming into an intersection all at the same time. One of them is trying to run, you know, a yellow light, and the other one's trying to jump a red light, mm -hmm. you know, and, and another one has dropped something on the floor, and you know, they just slide into the intersection, and they all crash. You know, and then when you're when you really try to attribute just one single explanation to a thing that has multiple factors that are sure. all being conflated, uh, you get confusion. And so our job at the New Paradigm Institute is to disentangle these kind of separate concepts of things that may be going on here and try to understand that there is a segregable, simple program of extraterrestrial beings who are substantially in advance of us technologically having discovered the superluminal travel, and they are coming here. Okay, uh, okay. that's so, simple. But with that, and I'm sure you get this question all the time, and I'm sure it's as frustrating every time someone asks it. Um, yeah. if, it is, if they're able to do exactly what you just said, and they're even, they've figured that out, then how do they crash? How does atmosphere hurt these things? How in whether and I've heard the theory that it's intentional that they want us to study it. Like, what do you believe? Why, if these things are able to travel that far, then how are they crashing? It's a uh, number one. We we have some we have some examples of it where at the at the very beginning uh, it appears that those those that we we have a very specific story, for example, from from uh, from Colonel. Uh, uh, What's he said? The uh, Philip Corso, mm -hmm. who was a range officer at White Sands at Yucca, Yucca Flats, you know, when we were doing the the testing of the original atomic bomb, that he encountered. He said he left it. I saw the film, a little eight millimeter black and white home movie he, he shot to be shown to his grandchildren after he died, uh, where he specifically told them about encountering a craft. That had, that had come down because they'd run into the massive amount of, uh, of radar 
that were up all around the 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 test facility there at Trinity site. Uh, and the, this particular vehicle had encountered all of that and it disrupted their navigation system mm-hmm. uh, and they were forced to land. Uh, and he actually encountered them and they communicated that to him. OK, now. The, but the fact of the matter is that that the so-called crash retrieval uh, crash retrieval project may well entail uh, an, an active kinetic program of trying to bring them down. Okay. We know that they've been ordered. Uh, there have been orders issued to fire on these, these craft, uh, and it proves pointless yeah. that they, they've been unable to bring them down with any kind of traditional weaponry. You know, so that that the United States uh, national security state has been undoubtedly working at the trying the attempt to develop some type of a weapon system by means of which they can disable these craft. You know, when you have reports like at Mon- Malmstrom where they come over the, the missile, the Minuteman missile site and shut off 10 of our nuclear missiles, our Minuteman missiles. Right. That obviously, the national security state and military is going to be trying to figure out some sort of a weapon system by means of which they can disable such a crap. The other thing you want to check out is Z-Biotics. And Z-Biotics, thank God I went to a wedding last night, and Z-Biotics is the reason that I am able to be here with you today. Um, they are the maker of the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It, you got to take your f- first drink of the night for a better tomorrow. Fact. It's engineered by a team of microbiologists, and Zbiotics is a pro- probiotic drink that breaks down the byproduct of alcohol, which is responsible for rough mornings after drinking. So you have a Zbiotic for the best results. You take your first drink of the night before you do anything else. You pace yourself, you hydrate, and you get a good night's sleep. And then you wake up feeling refreshed and ready to take on the day. I love it. It is game changer. I'm not young enough to be able to just do what I did when I was younger. Don't do it anymore. I take Zbiotic. I'm feeling good today. And every time I have a Zbiotic before drinks, I notice a difference the next day. Even a night out, I can confidently plan on it and doing shows. I'm moving. So I gave Zabiotics a try when they first came to the show. I drank it uh, last night before this wedding. And I'm telling you, I'm top of my game right now. You wouldn't even be able to tell uh, that I was drinking last night. So this year, I'm going to form a more sustainable and better me podcast and doing all this stuff. This is not a all or nothing approach. So you got to go to zbiotics.com slash big thing and use that code big thing. You check out for 15% off. And thank you to Zbiotics for sponsoring this episode and for all the good times. You know, and so that that may well be a part of the so-called crash retrieval program, which they're terribly frightened about of revealing. Right, which which well, which would make sense. Warfare, which would make them. of course, which would make sense, especially if they had any kind of progression over the last however many years since they've been doing it. That would make a lot yeah. of sense, especially if there's other countries that are working on it and they don't want other information now. That would make a lot of sense why they wouldn't want that information out but like i uh i get confused though when it comes to because there's there's those other reports and as you said with they maybe they have even communication with these things that have told them as much as that these things have been disruptive like if we have been in communication with them and that's another question i guess i can pose to you is do you believe that a we have been in communication that there is a certain part someone that is actually communicating and knows a what they are want what their purpose is and knows how long they've been here and and i believe i believe they've been here longer than us that's my that's my opinion well it's a, a lot of it depends on who all the they's are that mm-hmm. talking about here that you know have they been in communication that, that, you know, we we know that there are a number of what i deem to be very credible accounts of individual uh citizens having direct encounters with some of these beings there's a barbara lamb who's an extraordinarily credible person. She's a a 90-year-old lady who's a psychologist who had been uh, providing psychological counseling to numbers of people who believe sincerely that they've had direct face-to-face encounters with some of these beings, uh, usually in the context of a a craft being on the ground somewhere. Uh, And she she describes having a direct encounter with uh, uh, one of these, uh, a reptilian being standing in the middle of her living room, you know, about six feet tall, but giving off very positive, friendly vibes to her, you know, and, and communicating to her telepathically that, uh, that you don't need to worry. I'm just letting you see that we're definitely real. 
You've been interviewing all these people all this time. You wanted to know if we're real. Here we are. <coughs> so we know that, that, or we believe that there's very credible, uh, convincing evidence that if I were to present it to any jury in the country, uh, that they would believe it <coughs> from these witnesses. You're confident enough, but you're, but you're confident enough because you can see if, again, if you're not paying attention to this and, and, and someone just tuned into that for the first time, not hearing anything about it and heard, heard about a large reptilian creature, right? You could be like, what, what does this V like, what, what, what are we talking about? And like, you're confident enough to say that you, from the people that as someone as credible as the woman that you just mentioned, that you would be able to take this in front of a jury. You're confident enough that because obviously with, with your reputation is immaculate, you know, you've, you, yeah. the things that you've done. So you're confident that you would take something like that. What you just said in front of a jury as well. Oh yeah, I'd, I'd be I'd be willing to put Barbara Lamb in front of any wow. American jury, and that they would believe her. You know, and that the, that my part of my job for over the last forty five years has been vetting people to determine who are going to be presented as witnesses. Yeah, that was my job at the Disclosure Project all the way back in two thousand and one, and the the presentation of the two dozen people that we made at the National Press Club uh, in the Disclosure Program. I was involved in vetting the witnesses in 2013 mm -hmm. at the people's uh, public hearings on the UFO disclosure. You know, I was uh, I was the one that was in charge of vetting the witnesses to present for Dr. John Mack right. uh, in front of the tribunal. Yeah. So that's been my job. And so I know how to vet people. And I know the people that you can present to a jury uh, and present a completely honest and candid presentation of the facts. And I, I know how a jury will go on a thing like that. Now, that's that's as close as we can come in our present juridical system to get some kind of a definitive answer sure. uh, to, to facts like that. Uh, now, the, so I'm, I'm confident about that. <clears throat> and now, but when you, you, you pose the larger question uh, of the they, uh, is there some sort of juridical source of authority on the part of our United States government buried somewhere deep in the national security state or inside one of the military intelligence operations that has had any kind of direct communication. You have two, two different uh, fairly well-known instances where they, they assert that uh, that has happened. One at Edwards Air Force Base and another one uh, down in New Mexico uh, of asserting that there, there have been a craft landed at a U.S. Air Force base uh, and there have been direct civilian contact uh, with them. Uh, I have not at the present time uh, uh, credited those. I've heard those things. I'm open to further investigating them. I've, I've talked uh, directly with uh, Edgar Mitchell, uh, who conveyed to myself and Sergio Lube, who were with him up at uh, one of the IONS meetings, the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And he sat there and told me in detail that his best friend, who was Cooper, uh, explained to him that uh, he had uh, seen the, the film of this happening at uh, uh, Edwards Air Force Base of a landing and a direct communication where they spent hours communicating back and forth. Right. Now, I, again, I haven't, I haven't credited that to the point where I'd be willing to put it in front of a jury at the present time. But the bottom line is that the, it's, it's almost beyond rational belief. Right that over the last 50 years or, so, or last 80 years from going all the way back to Roswell, that given the, the absolute certainty that our government has from having recovered the craft and knowing that these are alien non-human bodies, that it's, a, it's almost impossible to believe that they haven't endeavored to open up some line of communication. That's what I mean. So I, that's why I think it's so crazy. That's why I think it's so crazy that it's like if you have that open, if that, that communication is there, why in the world would you be trying to come up with a system to try to take these things down if you're in communication with them? And they're like, hey, cut it out. Well, right? we, well I mean, we, 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 we have open communication going on with the Soviet Union. That's, uh, yeah. And we, we undertake to try to shoot down, that's a good point. Shoot down their crap uh, whenever we get some that's a good point. excuse for doing so. <clears throat> so, you know, so the, 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 the bottom line is that yeah, and the national security state that we have operating, and of course the national security state that the Soviet Union or Russia has operating, China, you know, the, these are non-rational. Yeah. The, the, this is, a, you know, they do things that are contradictory to each other, to an internally self-referentially consistent program. But the bottom line is, is that, that, that the shooting down or the bringing down through whatever kind of mechanism they might have developed, some kind of pulse weapon or some kind of uh, uh, vibrational 
uh, frequency machine that they may be able to use to interfere with their guidance systems to try to bring them down. Uh, I would not be surprised if they had such a component uh, in their in their UFO crash retrieval program. Uh, and and the, you know in the same way as I mentioned that we carry on this kind of Cold War relationship with Russia and China. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that the, there may be you know, knowing as I do the component elements of our national security state. One wouldn't be surprised that they do things like that, right? Uh, that, are, that are contrary to any kind of ethical uh, standards. Yeah. Uh, so, so, but, but again, I, I'm not. Con- it, I, well, on the one hand, it's almost impossible to believe that that our national security state hasn't undertaken serious efforts to establish communication with the extraterrestrial people uh, and to develop some kind of protocols of uh, engaging with right. them and having conversations with them. Uh, this this opens on to the the whole other realm of, you know, if in fact uh, elements of our secret elite are carrying on potential communications with these beings and refusing to tell the United States Congress about it, uh, you know, this is an, an ardent uh, violation of con- the constitutional uh, government that we have completely. Because- I completely agree with that. And that does you mentioned in the other countries. And I have to ask you this. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you this, too. When it comes to catastrophic disclosure, when it comes to this, like how a lot of times and this is a comment that gets it always makes me frustrated when I see it on my channel. And it's just like, why is it only the U- the United States that reports things, things? And clearly it's not. There's there's it's Russia, China, Japan. The list goes on and on. You just mentioned John Mack, the the, the big case. It was was it Zimbabwe? Is that where is that where Zimbabwe. it was? Yeah, yeah the aerial school. And, that's right. Yeah. So um, there's been tons of reports. But my question is, why is everybody waiting on the U.S.? Why doesn't like Russia or China go? No, we don't have this program of trying to cover it up the same way. Like here here's here's what we know. This is the deal. Is it because they don't want their information shown out and they don't want to? give up what they've been looking at like why if there's been these other rumors that you know grush has hinted at it that russia and china have been working on reverse engineering programs also why aren't they giving up information why are they why does everybody seem to be why do the other countries all seem to be doing the same thing the united states is doing it's like yeah we're not saying anything either well i mean the 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 number number one the united, the united states ever since as, as we know ever since the end of world war ii yeah the united states has been the overwhelming dominant military power on the planet. You know, we our military defense budget is is bigger than the total budget, adding up all the military budgets of the other 10 closest nations in the world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we've been successful in palming off our aggressive military posture, you know, on the planet, trying to establish full spectrum military dominance of the planet, passing it off as defense you know, for the last 50 years yeah. uh, in this propaganda campaign that's gone on on their part. And, you know, but, but the bottom the bottom line is that everybody knows that the United States is the dangerous actor uh, on the planet, uh, that we're the ones that are, are uh, serving the interests of a major elite uh, ruling class uh, in the Western civilization. We're the ones that are that are uh, promulgating their interests in trying to secure continued privileged access to the strategic raw materials on the planet. Now, the effort of the people to mount a, a kind of social democratic opposition to them foundered clearly uh, in the Soviet Union in Russia. It got taken over by Stalin and the authoritarians. Uh, and the, the same problem exists inside China. Uh, you know, that these that the kind of more idealistic efforts to establish a social democratic alternative to this kind of ruling class uh, in Western civilization has not yet been successful. They haven't been able to retain uh, the ideals uh, of their of their original endeavors. So that, that people know that the United States is the dangerous actor on the planet. Uh, and so that therefore the United States uh, has the kind of has gained the authority of being the one to go forward on anything that is as disruptive as this to the entire geopolitical system that is operational on the planet right now. Even with all of his whining, you know, Putin recognizes that the United States is kind of the overwhelming military power on the planet. You know, we have 800 foreign military bases around the world. You know, I mean, it just dwarfs uh, any number of of the uh, other projected military bases of China or Russia. Uh, You know, and so so that we're the dangerous actor and so everybody has to try to figure out 
what we're going to do uh, uh, because we can we're we're a very dangerous customer uh, and we could retaliate against Russia or China you know trying to do, trying right. to get ahead of us by what, re- releasing their knowledge about this but what if it's as something simple as I don't know where you stand on the case of the Virginia case you know but what if it's as something as simple as like there's more footage that comes out of that case and what if it turns out that the stuff like first of all what do, do you feel that the stuff in Virginia do you feel that that's all that that all actually happened or do you feel that that was a hoax which one? The, Give me more details. The, Var- oh. the James Fox did a um, did the oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah the Virginia yeah. case. Yeah. Of, uh, I don't know yet. I, I really don't know. I mean, that when when you only have an artist's conception of what they look like, you have you have a a, a couple of young women that, that you know that I've, I've talked with with Fox about yeah. this. You know, I mean, you know, if you get right to the to the property line of the guy who supposedly carried or his partner carried one of these bodies around, right? You know. Uh, and you walk away. You shouldn't walk away from them just because he brandishes a gun at you and says, "Get off my property." You know, you got to be a little more thorough going through investigation uh, before it, it satisfies me. You know that. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I have professional gun toters that are <laughs> investigators. You know, uh, I from when I was in F. Lee Bailey's office, we had an entire uh, office of forty. Uh, you know, a a licensed uh, gun toting private investigators working for us. And I've had access to some of those people in the investigations that we conduct on behalf of the public interest sure. organization that we represent, you know, so that we can we can engage in a little bit more aggressive type of investigating of things. And so I have that. One of the things that we're doing at the New, Par- <clears throat> New Paradigm Institute is gathering these investigators together to be able to conduct more deep diving investigations of some of those things before we can credit them. Uh, but. We we haven't done that yet with that particular uh, event. I've, uh, I've seen the movie and I've talked to to, to James Fox and all, but uh, I think that bears more scrutiny. That's fair. And so speaking of uh, James Fox, well, for, real quick, how how much longer do I have before before I um because I, I have a couple more questions. I just wanted. No, that's fine. I don't want to. I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. So speaking of James Fox, you know, he's got a new movie coming out, and he's been he, he well. James kind of it was one of those people that I mentioned earlier that when all these this information towards the end of the year and said, wait until the beginning of the year, we're going to see some stuff. And then he obviously went a little bit more um, silent because he was having the legal battles that yeah. was going on. And now he's got his this movie coming out, and some people wonder how much, because every time he tends to put a movie out, there's like big questions that start to get asked. And do you think that James's next movie could be part of a couple more questions, or it could just be something that maybe we've seen before. What do you know, if anything, about James's new movie? I don't. I don't know. Okay. I, I don't know. I've talked to him about it, and you know, I knew he had all those legal problems with people, you know, stealing the the uh, anyway. And, and this happens all the time. But the, but the bottom line is, you know, I I support him and praise him, and he he does an excellent job all the time, you know. And I think he and the other people. But what I'm, what we're trying to do at the New Paradigm Institute is get everybody on board, uh, trying to to purge the greed and, and self interest and avarice on the part of individual people. Uh, they either start to get stars in their eyes about thinking they're big celebrities, or right. or thinking that somehow they've got a, a corner on the market to to be able to make you know huge amounts of money to the exclusion of other people. That's that's not what James is doing. He's trying. He's, you know, laboring away like mad, trying to get information out to people. I don't know what new information he might he might have that he thinks is going to move the needle on this. But but we're we're all working to try to support getting the Senate Intelligence Committee to hold additional public hearings and to bring forward some of the 40 eyeball witnesses that they've got who can corroborate what it is that Grush said back on July 26th of last year that we have the active crash retrieval program we've actually recovered right. you know non-human extraterrestrial spacecraft and, and we've recovered bodies they've performed the biological tests on them to know that they're non-human the occupants uh, of the craft uh, now th- that's ex- that's right where the focus is right now and then we need to roll out another witness or two that carries it a little bit farther to saying look at let me tell you where the cra- one of the craft is so you can go <clears throat> you know bring U.S. Marshals with you to the site and find it, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and, and get a subpoena to go and find it. Uh, but you've got you've got to get uh, the the Senate Intelligence Committee has to be willing to exercise subpoena power, you know, to subpoena 
uh, to issue basically what they call a subpoena ducey stakem, you know, that demands the re recovery of a particular piece of property, you know, and you have to produce it uh, for Senate hearings. It, it, when, when they decide, that's a political question. And that's why we have to build up the support of the regular citizens around the country, people like you, as you said at the beginning, yeah. you know, who are kind of, you know, confused about some things. That's what the whole purpose of the New Paradigm Institute is, to be able to provide solid, credible information backed up by legal briefing and, and footnotes, you know, of, of what is true about this, and to empower the people inside each and every one of the 435 congressional districts right. to demand that their congressperson, you know, support the full disclosure of this information. Uh, oh. It's a very simple uh, algorithm that we have going right now. Well, uh, and that's what we're doing. It goes back to earlier what we were talking about with how the, whether it's the committee, the, the hearings and everything to it. Talk to me about the UAP caucus, right? Because it seems to be like whether or not this is, it's, it, there's going to be more, how much power they're going to have. And, and included with that about the caucus itself is that this thing with David Grush and is David Grush's involvement with the UAP caucus has been rumors that he's going to be, you know, of course, with them now and, and hired by, by the government, back to the government. Do you think he's going to lead the charge if he is indeed with uh, with the caucus? Do you think that's going to happen? Well, I'm not that the, the, I don't the, 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 there's lots of caucuses, you know, in, in the in the Congress uh, and they the, most of them, they don't have any real juridical authority or power. You know, for example, the, the, the caucus can't subpoena anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, there are very limited comment committees that have been delegated the authority to subpoena anybody, uh, to place people under oath and make them testify. Uh, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm totally supportive of what uh, Tim Burchette is trying to do, and along with the other congressmen uh, there that are in that, uh, that kind of group that he has. Uh, the difficulty is that plays uh, in the same field as the you know, the same, a lot of the same members of that group are the people who are threatening the Speaker of the House all the time to, uh, you know, to uh, put put up a vote and, and throw him out of there if he doesn't, you know, cut off all the funding to the Ukraine, you know, or to, you know, not oppose the bill that, that Biden introduces to on the border. Right. You know, so that there's all kinds of the eddies and currents of the kind of general politics that these people are involved in. And that this, you know, uh, fine, let him have a caucus. But the, the desire to try to set up a, uh, a select committee inside the House is not a good idea mm -hmm. because the select committee would be appointed by Johnson <laughs> as the Speaker of the House. Right. And you know where that one is going to go. Exactly. You know, uh, he would delve around to find, you know, any, any single or one or two Democrats that might be opposed to the, the big 64-page bill and put them on as the Democrats. And then he would go on the committee. Uh, Johnson would go on the committee. Uh, Turner would go on the committee, mm -hmm, right, uh, right. and and uh, and Rogers would go on the committee. You know, and they would kill anything that came near them. You know, so that's not a good idea. Right. Uh, right. So you know, I've I've studied this for fifty years about the the machinations inside the House and Senate, and and also it's premature, I think, to ask to have a joint select uh, House and Senate committee put together like the Church Committee. You know, it's premature to to try to get that done. I don't think the the uh, upheaval on the part of the public is is uh, large enough yet to generate that. But I do think that the time is ripe for the Senate Intelligence Committee to come forward with with one or more public hearings uh, where they're starting to let fly the information that they have from their 40 witnesses and start to put the pressure on. And I think that they they need to be willing to accept the compromise that. Once they start putting those people on, if if uh, Rogers and and uh, Turner and Johnson succumb and agree to pass the 64 page bill, then the Senate Intelligence Committee would step back right. Uh, right. and allow that that uh, that protocol to take place. Uh, and then we would have to move forward. Our new paradigm institute would have to recommend uh, people to the to the board that we've been authorized to do to recommend them to the president. Uh, and we could move forward. And that could be done. That possibly could be done before the election. 
Okay, and but what but what about but what about Grush's involvement in all of it? What do you where do you think where do you think he goes? What do you think that he should do? And do you think that he will again testify? Should we have? Will he get more clearance this time? Because it wasn't his fault, but one of the big frustrations with a lot of people, the regular folks, if you will, is like, well, this guy all he said is he can't talk about it behind a skiff, and I understand why he can. He doesn't want to go to jail, um, but. Is there going to be more clearance of things that he could say? What do you think? What is next? What do you believe that Grush should be doing next? I, I don't. I don't. Uh, I'm not counsel to to David. Okay. Uh, that uh, you know he uh, that uh, Chuck McCullough was his attorney uh, and advises him on what to do. And okay. uh, I don't. I don't know that, that Chuck has now left uh, and has gone to some private aerospace company working. So. I'm not. I'm not uh, sure who is legally representing David at the present time. Okay. Uh, and, and and I know that you know that I just know that people cannot allow you know who is going to hire him or you know who's going to pay him or which group is he going to be support. You know he he is providing information that is of importance to the public. Uh, and the House and Senate both know about him. Uh, that uh, he has been instrumental in providing the names and. Uh, contact information for other witnesses whom he had interviewed earlier. A lot of these people have come forward to the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, they have not, uh, many of them have not been willing to go to Arrow. Right. You know, uh, it, it wasn't just that it was under the supervision of Sean Kirkpatrick at the time. Uh, they still aren't going to Arrow. You know, they're they're going over to the Senate Intelligence Committee. That's that's become the, the central focus point. Uh, even, even though uh, Tim Burchett and some of the people in the the, the caucus in the House are vocal about their support of this issue. Uh, the, the real power at the present time resides uh, over in the Senate Intelligence Committee. Okay. Uh, and now, and there's also the Oversight Committee over on the House side, since they're the ones that chaired uh, the, the, the Grush hearings. You know, and so the, the, the diplomatic relationship between the House and Senate has to be worked out as to who's going to hold the hearings and who's going to present what witnesses. Uh, but the, but uh, the, the New Paradigm Institute is involved in trying to generate the kind of support from the public for whatever it is that they decide to do. But something has got to get done and something has got to get done quickly, uh, you know, before the maelstrom of the whole election starts devouring everything. Right. And as you, you know, and do it, do it uh, sooner than later. Yeah. And as you said, it does seem like, you know, there's always kind of like a move is one step forward. And almost so sometimes it seems like it's like one step back because people are trying to kind of uh, get involved. And as you mentioned, I think very well before, where if you put the wrong people on a committee, then they're going to, yeah. they have an agenda and they want to cause okay. some, some chaos. Um, but Look at, as you mentioned, I wanted to bring up Sean Kirkpatrick. I don't want to bring up Arrow because um, I don't know, for me as a regular citizen, I don't know now with Sean Kirkpatrick not there, should I trust Arrow, should I not trust Arrow? But one of the things I wanted to bring up with you is you had mentioned you, you wanted to talk to Sean Kirkpatrick and Ross Coldhart had asked you, and I thought this was very interesting. Ross Coldhart had asked you if you were straight out calling um, Kirkpatrick a liar, and you said, yeah, pretty much I am. And then he said, well, you know, you could you could uh, get yourself in a lawsuit here. Have you heard, after that comment, have you heard anything from Sean Kirkpatrick or anybody representing him? You're not, you're not going to get involved in a lawsuit for accusing some government official of, of lying. You know, I mean, they, they can't just go around they, they can't go exercising their power uh, as a as an executive official and then try to sue people for telling people that they're lying. So nothing so nothing came out of that. Lying. So Pardon? there was nothing that came out of that from that. There was no pushback no. on that at all. No. Interesting. No. Interesting. Not, I mean, it's Sean, Sean's not going to engage in that kind of petty stuff. Interesting. Um, okay. And the other side of it was, um, you know, you mentioned you don't represent Grush, but you do represent Lou, obviously. Yeah. Um, so as we were talking about, you know, the select committee, we had um, Representative Burleson was yeah. said that he had talked to Lou and asked him, because there's always this stuff on the internet and everyone's always, whether it's Reddit threads or everyone too, yeah. that there's these crazy wild theories that of not just Lou, but a lot of people that, that Lou is essentially part of a PSYOP and that Lou... Okay. That's that, been from the very first day that anybody ever heard about him. I mean, they've all started doing that. You, know, you got you got to understand, there are people, uh, especially now with access to the internet that people have, you know, who have all kinds of different levels of knowledge and sophistication. You know, they go all the way from uh, zero units of knowledge or sophistication all the way up to 100. Yeah. You know, and so people are going to be saying all kinds of things. And the simple fact that a person is, has ever been in the United States military, you know, causes some people to say, well, this person is totally untrustworthy. 
because, you know, he's agreed to take up a gun and kill people. So I can't believe anything he says. You know, those people are down around one, you know, they're in the single figures, you know, of political sophistication uh, or intelligence for that matter. <clears throat> you know, some people say all kinds of things, but but Lou is Lou has uh, it's been clearly verified now. I mean, there's great detail now about exactly what the relationship was between OTAC or OSEP, uh, you know, the, the Advanced Weapons Special Access Program, uh, the various unacknowledged special access programs, how ATIP came into being, you know, and what the what the uh, uh, the whole chronology is of all that. And it was a nothing burger. Yeah. You know, it was just people thinking that Lou had kind of over concretized the kind of juridical authority of ATIP, you know, as compared to OSEP, you know, but I mean, that, you know, that, that stuff is, that stuff is, uh, is just, you know, it's, it's just, you know, like, I don't know, trailer park talk. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Um, you know, I want to ask you two more things before I let you go. You've been very um, generous with your time yeah. today. Um, you know, speaking of that Ross Colhart, you had a, you had a whole conversation and it was, it was, fascinating with the the blue book documents and the things that you the, can i ask like in if you can how exactly how did you get the clearance in the first place to to even see those documents and and because because the request was made by the congressional research service uh, uh science and technology division uh dr marcia smith uh i uh, when i was special counsel to that uh, that uh, in, that investigation and that research project you know, uh, she asked me specifically what information I wanted to see. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I told her that I wanted to see, I, I knew right away, I said, I want to see the classified portions of Project Blue Book. And she said, oh, you know, they're never going to let us have that. And I said, well, you know, you're never going to get it unless you ask. Uh, and so I just please ask them. And so she did. Uh, and then the, much to her surprise, uh, you know, they said yes. And the, uh, she called me back and said, okay. Uh, here's where you go. You're going to go to the Madison building and you need to have two forms of, you know, uh, photographic uh, official government proof, blah, blah, et cetera. And that's how it unfolded. So that in the, so there's clearly a record, you yeah. know, of the people. There were four different security people, you know, uh, plainclothes security guys that were there, you know, that were from uh, the from the U.S. government. Wasn't any doubt about that. You know, and they, they had the authority to bring those files uh, to the basement of the, the Madison building and, and lay them out there for me. Uh, so I was clearly authorized to, to see it. And, uh, and uh, the, the request was for the, uh, the classified portions of Project Blue Book. And there, there are the photographs of the crash recovery. Right. I saw them. Well, some. So I think that the same question I think that Grush was asked uh, on certain shows too. Uh, did you ever have like a doubt? Were you ever like a hundred percent sure like this is all accurate, or do, do, did you ever like a hundred? Did you ever like think maybe that you were shown false information because you couldn't believe you could get it in the first place? And they were like, you know, let's yeah. show them this instead. That's that's, that's uh, too many too many amateurs getting involved in these processes that that think that they're smart by just going one step forward. It's like Inception, yeah. you know, you, the movie. Great movie. Oh, oh, no, there's another whole level of potential deception here. And what that gets you into is <clears throat> the QAnon. <clears throat> you, know, you can go all the way down into, you know, going under the streets of New York, finding children in cages, you know, right. if, you want to, if you want to just keep going. Uh, you know, the, what, what I do is I draw fairly reasonable boundaries uh, over what my uh, any suppositions are. And I investigate them and I come up with what the logical uh, explanation is at each given point. Uh, and I'm uh, consistently using the, the rules of evidence yeah. to figure out what it is that I would be able to present to a jury, you know, uh, and what type of authority the information would have. Uh, so, so that's the way in which that happened. And so that's what I saw. Okay. So I don't, I don't believe that, you know, that, they, that they, they brought in a whole, whole room full of boxes and documents and stuff. They didn't know which one I was going to open. They didn't know where I was going to look. You know, it would have taken me, I don't know, it would have taken me months to go through all the details of all the, the files they brought in there, you know. Uh, yeah. So they had no way of knowing which ones I was going to look at. So I don't think they they constructed an entire doctored set of files uh, to right. bring to me. Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Um, last question. The community itself, what I've noticed in, uh, is that you've got, as I mentioned earlier, it's like there's almost like 
it's a few different sides to it, but I think that the, you obviously have the skeptics that are looking to prove everything wrong no matter what. And there's, I think there's, I, I don't find anything wrong with people who want to ask questions and people who, as I said earlier to you, I have, I have kind of some pessimistic thoughts here and there, and I have questions. I'm more sway on the side of, I believe that there's other things going on out there. I believe more so that this is just too coincidental to be um, aircraft from another country, but I do believe in people asking those questions sure, and no, no. I'm, needing. I'm, I'm, I'm constantly cheering on people. I'm a person, a person who has been uh, as as much in the face of the national security state and the narrative that's been set forth by the United States government for the past fifty years. You know, you know, all the way from the Bay of Tonkin, lying about that. You know, all the way down to the lying about the UFO stuff. You know, I certainly can't criticize people for asking questions or challenging people or just woodenly disagreeing for the sake of right. seeing what a person's response is. Well, have you happened to use like for me, like I said, I'm, I'm more so on the side of disclosure. I'm more side on the I'm, I'm more of a believer. I really am. Have you and you very might might have done this and I just haven't caught it. But have you gone on shows that are or interviews with with because there's there's known skeptics there's known people who are just trying to debunk all the time have you ever done those particular shows or have you maybe not inv been invited to do those shows but I, I don't i mean i don't deal with people who are just kind of wooden uh you know nabobs Got it. you know they spend all their time just trying to deny you know this like the flat worlders you know <laughs> saying any kind of preposterous thing you know or just attacking anybody just to see you know stabbing people just to see if they bleed that's fair. You know, I mean, you know I, i'm not i'm not going to waste my time i've got too many important things to do Fair enough. You know, um, I have the people at, at my shop, you know, vet the requests that come in. Uh, and I, I talk with people that are credible people that I believe are in good faith, trying to find information uh, and asking good faith questions. And I'm trying to, you know, share the information as much as I can with the people in the world. Um, fair enough. And I think inside of that as well, that I have noticed that the community itself, the people who do believe and the people that it seems like there's almost sometimes that I think is. It, it, there's almost like this bizarre, and you you mentioned it earlier, and I and I and I couldn't agree more. There's like this weird, like kind of almost like drama that happens within the community, and like whether it's somebody looking for a, like a star power type thing instead of like a, asking the questions, and then people like infighting. And don't you think that's kind of detrimental to the cause in general? Like the, if if you're on the same side, and, and you don't have to get into depth with it, but I thought you answered it brilliantly when you were talking about like um, both Lou and um, and Stephen Greer. And again, don't get into the whole thing. It's not my point. The point the point is that it's like this. These are two people clearly that are on the same side, but yet they they can't come together. And then there's a lot of people inside of that. Do you think that that needs to change in order for more information and more unity to come out? Well. Uh, let, me, let me put it a little differently. If, in fact, we can help solve some of those problems, more information will come out. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, and it, it's not necessarily a sine qua non. I mean, that you know, we're going to get the information out uh, anyway, but it's going to be easier if people will cooperate. Yeah. You know, and we get all going in the same direction and we all understand who's on the same teams and stop trying to make up, you know, you know, subgroups all the time to fight with each other. I mean, the the left and the right do it all the time. They end up, you know, declaring anybody who isn't a purist believer in whatever it is they happen to believe, you know, as being, you know, anathema, you know, and the and the, that that's not helpful. We're we're trying to establish coalitions. You know, I've I've helped run a coalition that had 81 national organizations in it at one time to oppose Senate Bill One mm -hmm. uh, way back in 1976. You know, uh, you know, so the. We, we got 81 groups to to find something fatally wrong with the the Senate Bill 1, which was the effort on the part of the Nixon administration under the aegis of, of uh, then the special assistant United States attorney uh, Rehnquist, you know, to redraft the entire federal criminal code. Uh, it's just this hardcore right wing fascist, you know, redrafting of the entire federal criminal code. And I felt there was something in it to offend everyone. Uh, and so we, we put together this thing called the list of a hundred horrors, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, listed them all out, and we got uh, eighty-one of the hundred organizations that were offended to come together in a coalition. So I, I'm hoping that our new Paradigm Institute can help do that, can help bring together everybody who wants to have a greater degree of disclosure together, working together cooperatively to achieve that. 
uh, and I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to do it. Fingers crossed. And I have to thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for uh, giving me your time and a lot of great stuff. I really appreciate you being here. But where, if people do want to check out the New Paradigm Institute, what, what can they do? Where should they go? Oh, so go to go to newparadigm.org. No, no, newparadigminstitute.org. Simple. Newparadigminstitute.org. And you can find all kinds of different ways to participate. You can become a member of the Citizens for Disclosure. You can set up action teams in your local congressional district, write letters to your local editors and the newspapers, go to school assemblies, go to PTA meetings, you know, go to American Legion Club meetings, you know, and, and share this information. Yeah, we've got to rouse the people so that we all demand to get this information, you know, and that and that you can also get educated. You can get you can take the course. There's a course in extraterrestrial studies that is actually providing college credit uh, for this whole new field that's going to have to be developed. There's there's dozens of things to do. Go to newparadigminstitute.org and check out our website. Thanks again for joining us, Dan Sheehan, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate it, and I'll see you real soon, sir. Far out. All right. So there was a lot there. There's a lot there, man. That was my interview with Danny Sheehan. Um, yeah, listen, like I said, I had a lot of things that I wanted to know about that I was still, as I, you see, if you're following that other channel, I've been asking that question of, okay, so many people saying oh, this is going to happen in 2024, and we're still waiting for it. And he's like the same thing that Ross Coulthard said. There's just, there's There's – People who are coming forward, there's things that have to be that have to happen in order for that to go through. And his definition of what catastrophic exclusion could be for certain groups, and it was really interesting to hear all that. And I think it was also interesting. The reason why I asked if he would go on a like a skeptic show, and he said I have no interest in ha going on a show that is clearly just going to be, no matter what I say, they're going to be shooting me down. Um, and I understand that. I still think that the conference, it's maybe this is just a happy, um, unrealistic thing for me. It's why I asked that question in the beginning. Is there a way to get people on board together? Because I'm so in the pop culture side, I'm so sick of people screaming at each other and making and trying to make each other look stupid. And it's like, you know, even if you don't agree with someone, you think that they're crazy for thinking something or or they're crazy that you don't think something. It, it's like this whole thing is just gross to me. And it's like working together, you know, to me is is the way to go in general to get information, whatever, whatever you think it is out there. But nonetheless, that's why I asked the question. What do you think of the interview? Make sure you comment. Give me your thoughts. And like I said, if you enjoyed the interview, you want to see more things like this, every Tuesday we do this show. You subscribe to the channel. Help us get to 200,000. That's all I ask for an interview like that. Just asking you to do that. Check it out. All right. Thanks for joining us here today on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you to my guest, Danny Sheehan. Uh, and that's it, man. Check me out on my channel from Monday through Friday. It is the Down to Earth with Christian Harloff channel if you want more UAP news. But that's it. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere podcasts are found, man. That's a big thing. We'll see you.